Readers will be put off if you don't mention the light in Africa. Always use the word Africa or darkness. Treat Africa as if it were one country. Monkey brain is an African's cuisine. Always use the word Africa or darkness or safari in your title. Subtitles may include words Zanzibar, Maasai, Zulu, Zambezi, Congo. Never have a picture of a well-adjusted African on the cover of your book or in it unless that African has won the Nobel Prize. An AK-47, prominent ribs, naked breasts, use those. If you must include an African, make sure you get one in Maasai or Zulu or Dogon dress. New text, treat Africa as if it were one country. It is hot and dusty with rolling grasslands and huge herds of animals and tall, thin people who are starving. Or it is hot and steamy with very short people who eat primates. Don't get bogged down with precise descriptions. Africa is big, 54 countries, 900 million people who are too busy starving and dying and warring and emigrating to read your book. The modern African is a fat man who steals and works in the visa office, refusing to give work permits to qualified Westerners who really care about Africa. He's an enemy of development, always using his government job to make it difficult for pragmatic and good-hearted experts to set up NGOs or legal conservation areas. When your main character is in a desert or a jungle, living with indigenous people, it is okay to mention that Africa has been severely depopulated by AIDS and war. Always end your book with Nelson Mandela saying something about rainbows or renaissance because you care. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Nairobi. What we just saw is how the Nairobi team of the BBC paid tribute to Binyawanga Wainaina by reading excerpts from his satirical essay, How to Write About Africa, as you saw. The video was issued on the 30th of May when this great man was commemorated at the National Museum in Nairobi. This evening, is all for and all about Binyawanga Wainaina, who, as you know, sadly passed away on 21st of May. May his soul rest in peace. The evening is for him and all that he left for this world in thinking and writing and inspirations and, and so much more. An homage to Binyawanga Wainaina to celebrate his life and work. Yesterday, somebody mentioned or noted that the program of this evening would be very intense. Well, I thought that's probably what Binyawanga would have liked, or maybe not. I'm really not the person to talk about him. I am, at most, a fascinated reader who once shook hand with a gifted writer and enjoyed the sound of his laughter. That was when he was here in Berlin and he visited the foundation. I vaguely remember that he had happily been biking around town and told me about that. But as I said, I'm not the one to talk. We are very, very honored, however, to have with us such distinguished guests and friends of Binyawanga tonight as the acclaimed author Yvonne adiambo Ovoa. Thank you for coming, Yvonne. And the editor, Manfred Metzner, also very welcome to the foundation tonight, as well as Professor Maisha Auma, whom I'm also welcoming wholeheartedly. She will lead us through this evening. We're also very happy that Linda Gabriel will perform and Dennis Abraham agreed to read. Also a warm welcome to both of you. We, who's we? That is the ones who thought to create some space for this evening to commemorate Binyawanga also in Berlin, the Heinrich Böll Foundation, the
the International Rit Literature Festival, and each one teach one. And then there's you, of course. The space will be open for you to talk and share your memories and the mic or more privately after the event. Also, there's a live stream an op which offers an opportunity to many others who follow and screen. And I know of many, they've been writing to us who said, it's great you're doing this in Berlin. We would love to be there, but we follow the live screen. So they are with us and we also welcome them. We will hear now an excerpt from Discovering Home, read by Dennis Abrams. There's a problem. Somebody has fallen asleep in the toilet. The upstairs bathroom is locked and Frank has disappeared with the keys. There's a small riot as drunken women with smudged lipstick and crooked wigs bang on the door. There's always that point at a party when people are too drunk to be having fun. When strange smelly people are asleep on your bed. When the good booze runs out and there's only Sedgwick's brown sherry and a carton of sweet white wine. When you realize that all your flatmates have gone and all this is your responsibility. When the DJ is slumped over the stereo and some strange person is playing Brenda Fussy's latest hit over and over again. I have been studying here in Umtata, South Africa for five years and have rarely breached the boundary of my clique. Fear, I suppose, and a feeling that I'm not quite ready to leave a place that has let me be anything I want to be and provided not a single predator. That is what this party is all about. I am going home for a year. So maybe this feeling that my movements are being guided is explicable. This time tomorrow, I will be sitting next to my mother. We shall soak each other up. Flights to distant places always arouse in me a peculiar awareness that the substance we refer to as reality is really an organization as changeable as the puffy white lines that planes leave behind as they fly. I will wonder why I don't do this every day. I hope to be in Kenya for 13 months. I intend to travel as much as possible and finally to attend my grandparents' 60s wedding anniversary in Uganda in December. There are so many possibilities that could overturn this journey, yet I cannot leave without being certain that I will get to my destination. If there is a miracle in the idea of life, it is this, that we are able to exist for a time in defiance of chaos. Later, you often forget how dicey everything was, how the ticket almost didn't materialize, how the event almost got postponed, how a hangover nearly made you miss the flight. Phrases, well, becoming bigger than their context and speak to us as truth. We wield this series of events as our due, the standard for gifts of the future. We live the rest of our lives with the utter knowledge that there's something deliberate that transports everything into place if we follow the stepping stones of certainty. After the soft light and mellow manners of Cape Town, Nairobi is a shot of whiskey. We drive from the airport into the city center. Around us, matatus. Those brash, garish public transport vehicles, so irritating to every Kenyan, except those who own one or work for one. I can see them as the best example of contemporary Kenyan art. The best of them get new paint jobs every few months. Oprah seems quite popular now. The inevitable Tupac. The colored lights and fancy horn, the purple interior lighting, the hip hop blaring out of speakers I will never afford. Art galleries in Kenya by only the expression for which there is demand in Europe and America. The real artists, the guys who are turning their lives into vivid color, are the guys who decorate matatus. The matatus swing in and out of gaps, darting into impossible angles, turning the traffic into an obstacle course. Watching them with my no-hurry eyes, they seem like a form of jazz. Every trip, 
finding sophisticated and spontaneous solutions to getting their route accomplished as quickly as possible in Nairobi's aging colonial road system designed for small driving middle class. Public transport must find a way to make do. Oh, and they do. Manambas conduct the movement of the Matatu, hanging out of open doors, performing all kinds of gymnastics, as they call their routes, announce openings in the traffic, and communicate with the driver through a series of bangs on the roof that manage to be heard above the music. There are bangs for oncoming alleys, bangs that warn of traffic jams ahead, bangs announcing an impending traffic policeman. There are also methods to deliver the bribe without having to stop. I see one guy who is hanging on by his fingernails onto the roof, one toe in the open door, inches away from death, letting both hands go and clapping and whistling at a woman who is walking by the side of the road, dressed in tight jeans. She raised her nose and looks determinedly at an electricity pole on the other side of the road. This is Nairobi. This is what you do to get ahead. Make yourself boneless and treat your straitjacket as if it were a game, a challenge. The city is now all on the streets, sweet talk and hustle. Our worst recession ever has just produced brighter, more creative matatus. It is good to be home. Life's witness, Vinyavanga Wainaina, Ken, his family called him. Today's the first time I am saying his name in full after that Tuesday night message. Kenneth Vinyavanga Wainaina, born on January 18th, 1971. Dream generator, life seeker, truth seeker, love seeker, prophet, teacher, author, convener of people, ideas, imaginaries, Gadfly, nemesis to some, one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential persons in the world, African, human, friend, brother. Forgive me in advance, please, for there is no way to adequately speak this man, this Binyavanga Wainaina, not in the few minutes allotted, not in a day. Words, not enough exist that can contain him, his spirit, his energy, his massive laugh, the heart that sheltered so many, his works, his dimensions, his capacity to turn any moment into an all-night party. But I stand here, if only to bear witness and offer this gesture to my friend, my brother, my teacher, my mentor, the author, the human, Binyavanga. He would expect me to, knowing I was in Berlin, he would ignore my trembling knees my shaking voice, my breaking heart. He would demand that I not wallow, that I open my mouth and speak. So I stand here before and with you, for him, doing a most undesired thing, eulogizing a brother in a foreign land. On May 21st, 2019, that Thursday evening at about 10 p.m., a friend I was having dinner with suddenly asked, how is Binyavanga? I had talked to her about him before, and once she was present when June, Binya's sister, had contacted me to tell me he had been rushed to the ICU. He's better, I told her. And I shall later send him another of the love missives tonight. You see, with the encouragement of his sister June, who had rallied close friends to do so, I was one of those sending him phone updates, rambling rhapsodies, cheerful exhort exhortations of what to plot, questions about literature, updates on the Berlin weather, whining about travel, tra trouble with evolving a new story, that kind of thing. You know, spoken, on, spoken into the phone, so it played back to him. I returned to my Berlin apartment that night, found the phone I had left behind to compose a message to him when I found 12 missed calls from three different numbers. Panic. I checked my email in case there was a clue. There were three, and each one of them said, call June. But June called me first. She sounded forcibly cheerful, 
you know that laugh with an edge. She said, your friend, your brother, um, as you know, has been battling this thing for a long, long time. A brave, brave man, and so many people have come to see him. I, I, I knew, I knew. Later, much later, I would also wonder that a friend would have asked after him in that very minute of his passing. Uh, it has been a long, long night since. I grieve this crazy, mad brother as if he were a mother. And he was, for he midwifed my calling as a writer, my second life. I would not be here today if it were not for Binyavanga Wainaina. It is taking some time to come to terms with the idea and the sight of his repose, his not thereness. His remains have been cremated, but the resonance of his life is still so vital. You would agree? A distance is a wound that seeps, and from time to time it proposes the delusion of maybe, the what if, as if, apart from you, it is others who are deceived about such an absence. Uh, for that man, that wild, unruly, gifted, disruptive, mad, beautiful, cackling, glorious, mercurial, cosmic-hearted, generous, fabulous, flamboyant, wounded, beloved man, that prophet, that midwife, that seed giver, the story whisperer, showed up like an exiled angel in so many lives. He bounced into and boomed into my existence in a season of existential floundering, a time of dark uncertainty. He showed up like a firelight in a dark abyss. In, in 2002, we were invited by the designer Anne McCreeth to a party in Nairobi to welcome Binyavanga back to the city after he had won the Kane Prize for African writing. Many of us just went to gawk at him, uh, this man who had dared to reveal in new words the voice, pitch, and timber of a telling of a way that we truly were. We ended up being recruited by a hard partying, gifted, revolutionary, and visionary who, like the deity Ganesh, crumbled on the, crumpled the rocks of constraints, stomped on the fears that were limiting our dreaming. With others in so many spaces, in Ali Zaidi's garden in Nairobi, he imagined, created, paid for, crowdfunded, bullied us into imagining this astonishing, miraculous life, the movement, the imagination that was Kwani, the journal, and, let Kwa and later Kwani the trust, the platform and hub for a new generation literary revival, not just in Kenya, but on the African continent. I am the firstborn of the Kwani literary children. He would later direct and manage my initial forays into literature. He oversaw my text, refused to let me get away with it's okay. Our review sessions could be brutal, he had no time to pander and to comfort. He did what he did out of a tender love for story, the person, the continent, for excellent excellence. Binyavanga. He had this way of looking at you. The, the initial image was that look, that look. He had this way of seeing into you, beyond you, of recognizing even that which you did not recognize in yourself. His glance encompassed and pierced the person, the group, his friends, the country, continent, world, and words. And best of all were the words that would erupt forth out of his seeing. Story, knife-edged, haiku-like insights, cut, cut, revelatory, incandescent, drawl, sarcastic. Clear, even if the conversations were eased with all sorts of liqueurs, the knowing, the urgent expressing, Loud, loud, and his words were bullets that hit home, shattered set sinews, reverberated, wounded, transmuted presences. How many are we whom he dragged out of complacent corporate existences into the unknown, where we would at, least, at, at last live, truly live, feral and uncertain lives, yet different and breathing differently? Ah, this big man, my brother, my friend, if I'm less shy, it's because he dragged sound out of me. After he lit the fire that helped me find a literary voice, he managed me, and not with permission, mind you. Change your agent, change the story, visit this place, write me an article, show me your manuscript tonight, reorganize your text. You must do better. This is fucking good. This is shit. And one could get cross or irritated, 
but he could never hold a grudge against the bench. You witness to the life of this person you love. You hold the space for them. You are present. The only opinion about them that matters is that you belong. Somehow you belong. In the end, that's what mattered. The extra gift was that of being allowed to glimpse aspects of his other inner life. The life not many knew. The deeper shadows of that beloved. And therefore then the opportunity for shared masklessness. And it was a kind of love. Even a love that included our different madnesses. It has been a long night, Binya, mentor and barometer. Each book I have written has a ritual. Before it enters its next phase, it goes through you. Did you know I prepared for that moment as if for my own execution? Your words would be ruthless, but they're always right and true, with your wicked desire for high standards. But isn't that why you would not allow all the books you carried within you to flow? That idealized perfection that seized you and stopped you? Yet you were kinder to us than you were to yourself. The first version of the book that became dust, the manuscript, he said. I delayed the inevitable. I lived in dread, but inevitably, inevitably I handed it over. Days later, he called. He went straight to the matter. This is crap, eh? A polemic, Yvonne, is not a story. Premise. Where's your premise? And what are you doing here and here and here? Get out of the way of the story, eh? It took seven years after that to be able to offer a manuscript that he could inhale as deeply as he did all his illicit cigarettes. The tingle, he said. That was the signal that a story had passed his master. His feeling, his patient sense of story. Not just story, life. For he's the witness par excellence. I've often told the story of how in the season of our country burning itself down in 2007 and 8, an agitated man in a taxi showed up at our different house gates. He was furious. He was abrupt. Hit the, hitting the gate, he said, okay, I show up at the gate, and he says, in the moment our country's life is, is bleeding, you think you can lurk in your house and play safe? Pack your bags now. We are going. Each one of us who joined that trip should have asked Binyavanga to where. There were eight of us who ended up on a deserted national highway in two cars, speeding towards the epicenter of our, nas our nation's insanity, from where we were let loose to witness, chronicle, write, tell, act, listen, learn, and choose how to salvage, be, lose, or rewrite Kenya. Madness. Madness. But there was something about our friend that infected us with the delusion and illusion of our omnipotence, our indestructibility. We could traverse our continent grounded in our sense of vocation, amplified and urged on by Benyavanga. The dramatic outcomes of such collective African witnessing, pilgrimages, the post-election violence stories, Kwani journals, the manuscript prize that launched so many other African writers into the world scene. All these as a consequence of falling into line with a restless visionary, an untethered genius that would also burn itself and himself from both ends of a giant candle. The late Czech phenomenologist Jacques Patoshka on the puzzle of intersubjectivity observed that human existence does not exist on its own and by itself. We are beings for ourselves, but we are also beings for others. This means, I suppose, that no human encounter happens without leaving its trace an inflection mark on another. Then there are those who not only leave a, a trace of their presence on another, their lives enter the essence of these others and transmute and change it forever. You know, he would start, you know, and a galaxy of ideas, a deluge of words. He had a way with worlds, with words. There's little of the world spaces that he did not explore. He was attractive to the salon guardians from London to Moscow. He was one, at one point a necessary presence, an accessory to secure if you are having a party. He reveled in these, the fine and good things of life, an epicurean to the hilt with large appetites, but none in the end could compete with his appetite for the African continent and the Africa idea. I grieve the books he would have written, would have, his way, his words. There's no one way to describe Binyavanga Wainaina, no one person can. 
Every offering so far is a revelation of another dimension of this amazing being. The Nigerian blogger and columnist Ikide Ekiola, in an essay titled Our World According to Binyavanga Wainena, called Binya a brilliant lunatic, who writes about darkness with startling clarity and casualness. He was the guru in what the writer and close friend Paselelo Kantai has called the age of love. It refers to a heady, wild, creative, fecund season of all our imagined invincibilities, of our Afro-galactic luminous endlessness, as was summoned into being by our wild, uncontainable, bold, daring, and incandescent heart of, to, of the, our tornado, the binge. As the song puts it, we were beautiful then, and we knew we could rewrite the universe on our terms. Binyavanga Wainaina, driven by a frenetic sense of energy about fulfilling the big dreams he felt, an impatient soul, and we would be caught in his whirling, his tailwind, and then discover ourselves at the center of impossible dreams, organizing a festival for him at your own expense, taking off to Kinshasa to cover the life of a city in the time of the World Cup as a member of his pilgrimages project, leading a strategic planning session for his Kwani, also at one's own expense, giving three days to arrange and attend a residency in New York at his expense. But there was no leaving Binyavanga, you know. Not once he had chosen you to love, not if you loved him. It meant you loved him in his fullest, sometimes wounding. But fortunately, somehow, I escaped that, his capacity to wound. It meant you loved him in all his binyavanganess, a complex chameleon. Descriptions of him ran the gamut of the entire human possibility, as if he is one who contained 10,000 souls. Funny, mean, mercurial, disruptive, damaging, dangerous, gifted, brilliant, iconoclast, idiosyncratic, irritating, irritable, adversarial, artistic, ad adventurous, flamboyant, fey, generous, humorous, Kayan, lonely, loving, loud, melancholic, naughty, outspoken, gay, pain in the ass, pontificator, politically incorrect, prophetic, Racy, rude, wounding, wacky, youthful, yeah, his life to life, his yes to life was such an absolute one, zealous, zebra hair, zanny, zappy, and probably, probably every other adjective available. This complex, beautiful man, this complex, complex, crazy, beautiful man who entered into life without apology. Yet many were the times, as a Harrod group, we, his followers, everything we had to say was contained in a sigh, eh, binya. My friend was, is a colossus in the biggest sense of the word. He seized and grabbed the world and owned it without changing his strident, passionate uh, pan-Africanism. He simply shrugged off constraints of borders, boundaries, geographies. An in-between person, a child of two different African cultures and nations residing in Kenya, the conflicts and expectations arising from this melange struggled hard inside him. As his stature exploded, there was the usual soul traders who sought to associate their enterprises with his rising star. Some were more seductive than others, but in time, Binyavanga dealt with this by shrugging them off and inhabiting more fully his plural being. He found great impulses in the Africa unknown, unseen, forgotten a man seeking out all the cosmogonies in deep places of home, and by home, I mean the entire African continent. His Pan-Africanism was informed by having tried to make a home elsewhere. He traversed the world, the Europe's, the Americas, looking for something infinite, meaningful, encompassing of his profound hunger and thirst for life, for meaning, for truth and love. He often found these, in spa he found these spaces far too limiting in their worlds and worldviews and the conception of the human being. He was weary of cultural propensities that labeled and pathologized our Africa. Moreover, Binya had very early understood he was no missionary called to attend to or educate anybody's willed ignorance, nor a traveling priest to offer absolution to ancestral sins. Such was his discomfort with such spaces that even when informed in 2011 that the platelets in his, in his head might end his life abruptly, 
so he should stay close to medical services such as those offered in places like this, not even the risk of sudden death would make him stay. He rushed home, back to Kenya. But even that return home was imbued by a persistent restlessness that seemed to infect, infect a post-independence generation of in-betweeners, the not quite thereness of a destination called home, coming home, the impermanent exile, etched with a familiar restlessness of wanting home to be home, always seeking home within home, moving, moving. This Nakuru-raised, Nairobi-infused Pied Piper, also pursued by many, show us where to go. We expected him to know the way. Are you at home now, B? Still, it has been a long night, bro. Rager against nights. After the first of his strokes in 2011, I saw him. He showed me the x-ray sheets of his brain, the dark spots. He's a matter of fact. You know, I can keel over and die any time. Those black holes, always threatening. But being Binya, he disregarded the holes. Stroke after stroke, he always made it back. But each stroke came and left with something vital that belonged to him a scavenging hyena biting huge chunks of a wounded, powerful buffalo. And still Binya cackled, he laughed, he pontificated, he drank and swore and wrote and read and laughed and scolded and encouraged and smoked illicit, illicitly. He knew that his smoking made me so angry. So he always had a herbal cigarette to show me when we met. He always said, smell it, it's medicinal. And he knew I would always believe him that where, I was, where he was concerned, I was gullible. My wounded prophet, Binyavanga, you see, saw the hidden wounds of others, of those close to him. He read through silences the things and said, he saw clearly, but with the graciousness of honoring these wounds by not revealing them. You knew that he knew, and he knew that you knew that he knew. But he was also a mischievous friend who knew exactly when to use what he knew to secure what he wanted from you. Mid last year, I visited him before leaving Berlin. He was struggling, ailing. He had scoured souls in his long descent, you know. Burnt many as he burned himself out. But in that visit, our last, he was reflective. You see, he was losing his sight, but his longing to read new, and his longing for new literature burnt strong. And we spent some time trying to figure out how he could hear story, access story, even though his hearing was also going. He deflected when I asked, how are you? Fine, fine, he said. Speaking of projects to come, he was always dreaming. He never stopped dreaming. How are you, he wanted to know. Tell me everything. I played along. We played along. Cowards, you see. We had needed Icarus to fly even closer to the sun to show us that this was possible. It was the melted wings, the falling, that most of us could not endure, you see. So we did not talk about existential loneliness of the unfinished quest for a cosmology capable of holding him. We did not speak of, we did not speak of the ones that no longer called back, of private tears, of the insane cost of being fatally sick in a Kenya that could do better, better but did not. We pretended we had time. We had been here many times before, he always returned, you see. Even though in his returns, he would return without his voice, without words, without sight, without balance, without hearing. But you see, his thoughts always bubbled. Ideas still flowed. The books still he dreamt of still needed to be done, and he dreamt about doing them. And we really believed there was time. Now there are tributes flowing for Binyavanga, spoken of and he's spoken of in the past tense, words from every part of the world, and none is abstract. He pierced lives that he encountered, every shape of existence chained because it met his and him. His influence was unconstrained by geographies, by cultures, by race, by those limits we impose on our humanity. He had lost patience with limitations attached to human wholeness. Perhaps he deposited portions of his heart within ours, geologic presence, layered, complex, variegated. And there's no predicting that the one Binya anyone saw was the same Binya another had a beer or 20 with. 
his aura, they are the ones the world knows, they are the ones the galaxy building ones that remain undone, the ones we heard about and longed for. They are the ones that are so well known they have become canonical, discovering home that spurred a whole other way of writing, us. One day I will write about this place, a brilliant coming of age text for both a boy and his country. That grant a letter to the editor that became the viral How to Write About Africa. The 2014 YouTube episode after his I'm a, I'm a Homosexual Mom coming out essay. All his Twitter, Twitter rampages, and that's there because of that, to honor that. He did love his social media handles. His many pieces can be, many, his many pieces can be found in an archive of his, of his work, both on Kwani and planetbenya.com. Death. Death is a most incomprehensible moment. There are some absences that are unreal, like Binya's. Death is a feature of life, that's true, but it's outrage. Its strangeness does not lessen. So yes, we hurt. And realize again that each death has its unique blueprint, its particular effect. Where has he gone, this friend, this brother of ours? Where are you, B? The author, the gadfly, the human, my brother. Biyamanga Wainaina. Died at 8.10 p.m. on May 21st, 2019. He was 48 years old. He is so dearly loved, so painfully missed, so urgently longed for. Binya, I hope that you are at peace in that wherever. In the interim, sweetheart, thank you for everything. Thank you from the womb of our souls for you, for words, for the falling off of the things that shackle the mind and heart. I will stop here, but my darling, Zafai Njema, and when time stops, Lala Salama. P.S. Dear Binyavanga, I'm struggling with form in this new story. I could do with your help, as usual. If you have some time, I would be so grateful. Call me. Love always. Ifon. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Um, it's um, a profound uh, take on a beloved uh, soul, and um, I'm emotional, you're emotional now. Um, yeah, life is messy. <laughs> I think that's very much in, 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 in Binya's spirit. So um, we have about 10 minutes to um, uh, go into a little bit more depth. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd like to say to Yvonne Adhyambo uh, uh acclaimed, accomplished uh, Kenyan author, uh, won the Kane Prize for African writing a year after Binyavanga Wainaina. She wrote Dust, and your new book is called The Dragonfly Sea. I'm looking forward to that book, and it's a pleasure um, to see you again. It's a pleasure. Every time you speak, you speak from such depths that I'm always completely in a mess after you're done talking. <laughs> so I, I always know when I'm going to, to, to any of, of, of your performances, you're going to tap into some deep stuff. I'm going to be a mess after that. So yeah, anyway, thank you so much for that. Um, I like how you say, you talk about the motherness of Binya and about Binya being a midwife and how you navigate all these layers of the galaxies and Binya's mind and ideas and everything. So I have a comment and I have two short questions. So I met Binya, uh, I was supposed to meet Binya at the ALA in Bayreuth 2015, I think it was, and I was super tired so I went to bed. And right next to me, the fucking boys which is a group, <laughs> that's really their name, <laughs> Ghanaian group. Um, and Binya, they were partying with Peggy Peter and Nadia Ofuete Alazad. Am I allowed to uh, disclose this information? There was a hard party, Miriam Kamara was also there. There was a couple of folks partying in the room next to me so I couldn't sleep until 8 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> 
And then uh, the next day I said to Peggy, so where's Binya? Binya had moved on to his next appointment. I thought this was before his stroke because he was partying really hard, but this was after the third stroke. So um, I actually met Binya uh, during his DAD, DAD fellowship in Berlin in 2017, I think it was. Um, he lives in Charlottenburg, uh, Stuttgart Platz, or he lived there. I'm, I'm having a hard time with the past tense. And I also live one block away from there, so we kind of like did the Charlottenburg thing after he had some very difficult experiences there, an altercation with a taxi driver, a racist incident. So anyway, that's, that's like um, the backdrop. And I said to you before, to all these things you're calling Binya, for me, Binya was a radical inclusionist. Mm -hmm. So I've been, I looked at my last messages from Binya, and I was also seeing on his Facebook feed with all the shock when I posted on Facebook. Um, I, read, I went to his feed and read what people were posting. And there was one post where he was saying he was looking for uh, people with disabilities, other able, differently abled people, um, to dance at the Berlinale in Berlin. He wanted a huge group dancing, people with other abilities uh, uh, dancing at the Berlinale. It made me want to dance as well. And then there was also someone else writing, Binya's last message was he was going into organic farming now. And he was looking for anyone who has any ideas because he s s apparently didn't have any ideas about organic farming. <laughs> but he was looking for people who have any ideas because he was going to um, um, start organic farming for LSBTI people in Kenya and for collectives. And so, and, and, and today I was reading his feed again, and, and he was saying to someone else, uh, we want to work with you. So this was always Binya, like some weird ideas, some of the ideas made no sense at all on any galaxy. But here he was recruiting folks, like saying, we want to work with you, we want to do this and the other. And it's just the bigness of, of all of this, and not standing on the sidelines, engaging deeply in life. So uh, having said all of this, which, which does not even capture, that's why uh, uh, I'm glad that you went into this depth and breadth to just give us an intimate take on the meaning of, of, of this huge soul. I'd like to ask about the pettiness, though, now as well. <laughs> because it's, it's, all, it's, it's all a part of, of Binya's soul. Because Twitter is a petty space. It's hard to, not, to be on Twitter and not be petty. I read Twitter passively. What was Binya doing on Twitter? What's these rampages about? What, what, what was he doing on Twitter? Can you tell us something about uh, um, his uh, activities on Twitter and how that fit, fits into all these layers of who he was and what he was trying to do? You know, I, I wish I could tell you what exactly he was doing on Twitter, <laughs> but the thing about Binya was, uh, uh, he was he was an agent provocateur. Mm -hmm. uh, he might decide that uh, Okay, every, every, things are a bit quiet now. What can you, he, he was, you know, here's the, he was the, he was the ultimate, uh, what do you call it, cat among fat pigeons. So you would think, oh, okay, people are getting fat and complacent here. What can we do to absolutely provoke them and raise the greatest sense of, uh, of rage and riot? And, and it, he took great pleasure in that. I watched him sometimes do that, set, set things on fire, and, and you meet him in, <laughs> illegally, illicitly smoking and drinking and laughing, cackling away, <laughs> just following the kind of flow, the kind of mess. It was a kind of, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, a perverse kind of pleasure in provoking, in making things uncomfortable uh, for, the, for, the com for the comfortable, yes. Mm. Uh, so that links into my second question about uh, um, when he said, don't be hiding in your houses while our country is burning down. Let's get out and, and get engaged. And I'm going to speak about an uncomfortable pa part of conversation also, um, which I think was on Facebook and which Binya also had personally with me when uh, he was in Berlin. I cooked for him. He came over to my house. The crew was at my house drinking uh, uzo nectar and, and eating Kenyan food. Uh, Kenyan food is basically food that's cooked for nine hours. We, we, we like to like cook our stuff really slow. Meat, it's cooked like on some people pour beer into it and cook it for like 10 hours. So that's Kenyan food. Anyway, sorry to the vegan people. I don't mean to be disrespectful. And <laughs> it usually involves goat and, and, and sometimes fish. Because Yvonne is my home girl. We, we come from Kisumu. We are big on fish. fish. Fish is everything. In any case, to come to my question. So Binya was speaking about being HIV positive. And uh, he went on Facebook. Uh, at that time, I wasn't reading uh, a Twitter. And he was writing about, in a hopeful perspective, so it's also his whole fragility, but also resilience, that, that he had been living with HIV. And he said, and he ended by saying, and I'm happy. And it made me, um, it was, there was something very fragile about it, but it also made me think, I, I could feel my mind expanding about someone saying I'm living with HIV and I'm happy. 
And then shortly after, I think he announced like he's very much in love. So there was always like this passion coming out, how he was passionate about a pair of jeans that he tried to wash in Berlin at the dry cleaners. He lost the tag, and he was trying to get the jeans by telling them the story, the backstory, because he bought these jeans in a specific market in Nigeria, and the people at the store wouldn't give him back the, the jeans, although he had a very good narrative to go with. And I was like, Binya, this is not about the narrative. These people are just scared of giving someone else the jeans out and everything. So what I'm trying to say is, Binya made me grow my mind and expand my mind as well. And, and, and not stand on the sidelines. And uh, um, I wanted to ask you more about, about this kind of, it's, it's, you, you called him a prophet, and I think it's more the midwifery, to give birth to things that we are not even able to, to put into language. Um, what, can you, what, can you, what can you tell us about from, from being such a close associate and friend and, and intimate companion? about that side of Binya, about these, this, how, how, how do you even navigate the whole discomfort of having conversations that people are not, are not, are not even able to have? How, does, how did he do that? Again, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I truly don't. But what I do, what I am aware of, a lot of the things that he would then, um, uh, what do you call it, you know, a post, were things that I guess intimates knew about. Um, but then what would happen is he would use the process to maybe process this for himself um, before posting it and sharing it out with the rest of the world. But he had this capacity to go within, um, to, to wrestle with the darkness within uh, and, and come to terms with whatever it was he was confronted with, with, what, 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 with whatever he was facing. But also having said that, some, some of the posting, some of the vulnerability which you so wonderfully detect um, was, uh, if we're going to be truthful about our vulnerabilities, was a kind of, I think, questioning, am I still going to be loved anyway? And, and he had this great capacity to love, but also had this capacity, this longing to be fully loved as he was. Yeah, yeah. That's super courageous, and it seems to me to be like a, a, um, a double-sided midwifery, because we are also then birthing parts of, of Binya while Binya is telling us uh, um, whatever he's wrestling with in, in that sense. So my last question in this round, and we're going to have a, a possibility at the end of the evening um, to share, people can, can share about their memories of Binya or their last messages, and both of us will sit here again together and midwife that process. <laughs> uh, uh, so it's, it's also possible at the end of the evening to ask a direct question of Yvonne. Um, for now, I want to ask about Kwani. How is Kwani doing? And how is Kwani going to live with the bigness of the mothership uh, supernova -ing? And 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 how is what's going to go on? What, what are you doing with Kwani now? Um, from what I know, strangely enough, it seems that the, the uh, Kwani itself has followed the, the life of its um, founding spirit. Um, so I think it's in a bit of a, uh, in ICU right now, but I'm sure after season it will return. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's also really deep. So ICU intensive care, uh, uh, which is also where Feminist Africa, one of my favorite journals, is right now. We seem to be in a moment of crisis again. So I'm really hoping that um, there can be a perspective for that because we need, we need the resources, the symbolic resources to keep these narratives going. Uh, I don't think we need to be afraid. I think everything has a life cycle and, uh, and, and it, will just, it will of course return um, in, a, in a new powerful way that speaks to the time. Okay. Yeah. It, yeah. Okay, so thank you so much for this first conversation. We will be back on stage for the um, sharing part at the end of the evening. Thank you. Thank you. you want to take some water with you? I'm so carried away by emotion that I forgot I'm, I'm, I'm moderating this lovely soul, Linda Gabriel. Uh, Linda Gabriel and I met at IOTO and, or on Facebook, one of the two before, I don't know which came before which. Uh, Linda Gabriel is a poet, 
and an activist. And Linda, you have um, uh, the link to Binya right now is the uh, organic farming. I had no clue you are an organic farmer. I knew that you do dreadlock care uh, because we were trying to like like uh, communicate about that. But Linda has an NGO where she's empowering uh, women in um, Zimbabwe um, in in issues of uh, sustainability, um, food production, but also land ownership and uh, 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 to feed themselves and their communities and to be more self reliable. So there's a link also to the work going on here at the Heinrich Böll Foundation. And uh, tonight we're going to see the side of you that's uh, the poet. So the stage is yours. We're Thank looking you. forward to that. Uh, good evening. Um, my take of Binya is I think he was very brave and bold. If you're living in most African countries to be gay and open about it and write about it, it's also putting your life um, at risk. Uh, so some of my work tonight will speak on some of the brutality that's going on in many African countries in terms of uh, the LGBTQ community. They were silent. How could they not have talked about their death? The newspapers, the radio, the TV did not see this as newsworthy. This couple brutally murdered. You see, the community decided to be silent. No one talked about their great souls. These two were known to be the most generous. In privacy, poor women from this community would flock in the night to their house. These women knew all it took was just a knock on the door and help would come their way. But the community ignored this fact. You see, these two could have simply qualified as therapists. They listened too well to everybody's problems. They even saved many from committing suicide privately. They were pillars that the community leaned on. They would put aside their own just to accommodate you. This wasn't even talked about. You see, the community decided to forget how great dancers they were. At boring parties and weddings, they made them lit. They carried their dancing shoes to wherever space that they went to. These two, when they lived in Cuba and Brazil, they had taken salsa classes religiously. So they danced on street corners to music coming out of Shabins. They danced at schools to inspire high school, ghetto kids that were the talent. They danced at funerals, consoling those who were mourning. These two danced for every hero that ever lived. You see? We also forgot that on how many girls and young women got a, got a thing or two on makeup, fashion, anxious pageants. They would go to their houses sit and sip wine and coffee and consult and get free advice on what to do on your first day at work. You see, we didn't talk about this. This couple, brutally murdered. I'm told the night it happened, they were doing dishes in their kitchen. 20 fingers, 20 toes, cut off one by one in slow motion. Their tummies were cut open for their insides to hang out and to be poked at. Their bottoms were set on fire on gasoline. You see, their cocks were cut off to disgrace them. These two men were left hanging in the ceiling of the house that they'd shared in secret for so many years. They were left facing each other so that each partner could witness their partner's last breath. These two men, if they were your uncles, your brothers, your cousins, maybe your fathers, would you have allowed a mob to murder them? I ask again, these two men, if they were your uncles, your brothers, your cousins, your close friends, would you have allowed a mob to murder them simply because these two loved each other? Thank you. Currently, I think it's every mother's wish that they raise a generation of, of better men. So this is my wish as a mother one day. Wow, I breathe the hope that when unborn sons are given, they will be different. They will seek wisdom, and they will seek wisdom more than their fathers had acquired. These unborn sons will inherit qualities of their mothers and grandmothers so that when they love, they will love eternally, and when they listen, they will do it better. 
Wow, a breather hope that when born sons are given, they will be the chosen ones. They will lend a hand and share a dollar. They will use kangas to bundle babies on their backs and their voices will not go unheard. Their eyes will help many see beyond mountains and their feet will help many cross rivers. In trying times, communities will grow to depend and lean on their tough shoulders. These unborn sons will not only fight to change the system, but the hearts of those in power. So while I breathe, I hope that my unborn sons will not raise clenched fists over their women, but for Uhuru, they will protect themselves first and the ones they love most, and when they too are hurting or heartbroken, they should be able to shed a tear, pour out their hearts, they will admit their wrongdoings and strive to correct their mistakes. While well, I breathe the hope that my unborn sons will not run away or deny responsibility, each woman that they'll drink, each woman that they'll drink from will be crowned a queen. And when these unborn sons are fathers, their daughters will have best friends. While well, I breathe the hope that each breath be multiplied, so that I get to watch my unborn sons become men. Among them will be future leaders, leaders who be loved and adored, leaders who not kill or fight for a vote to be heard, leaders who not see black or white, they will see humans. These unborn sons will teach us to forgive and they will unite many nations. These unborn sons will remain in assurance and they will assure this world that they are different, for they shall remain sincere, meek, and humble. So I will breathe the hope that when unborn sons are given, there will be a blessing to you and you. Vielen Dank. Nachmittag. Wir spielen hinter dem Haupthaus Fußball, gleich bei der Wäscheleine. Jimmy, mein Bruder, ist elf und meine Schwester Siru ist fünfeinhalb. Ich bin der Torwart. Ich bin sieben und habe immer noch keine rechte Ahnung, warum anscheinend alle um mich herum wissen, was sie tun und warum sie es tun. Du bist nicht fett, das sagt man mir immer wieder. Du bist pummelig. Siru hat den Ball. Sie ist klein und schmal und goldig. Sie hat spitze Ellbogen und ein Lächeln so klar wie eine Bleistiftzeichnung. Ganz ebenmäßig gräbt es sich in ihre Wangen. Sie rennt auf Jimmy zu. Der ist groß und stark und dunkel. Sie ist der Star ihrer Klasse. Wir haben 1978. Zufällige Geräusche drängen mir in die Ohren. Autos, Vögel, die Klingeln der Black Mambas, Kinderstimmen aus der Ferne, Hunde, Krähen und die Nachmittagsmusik des staatlichen Radiosenders. Kongo Rumba. Vor unserem Grundstück unterhalten sich Leute in Sprachen, deren Klang ich kenne, von denen ich aber kein Wort verstehen oder gar sprechen kann. Luya, Jikuyu. Mein Lachen ist weit weg, tief in mir, wie bei einem Auto, das am Morgen nicht starten will, wenn der Zündschlüssel umgedreht wird. Es ist immer Siro, die in der Schule die Beste ist, mit blauen und roten und gelben Sternchen auf jeder Seite. Immer ist es Siro, die im weißen Kleid am Parents' Day dem Ehrengast, Mr. Ben Metu, die Blumen überreichen darf. Wenn wir baden, spritzen und lachen und raufen wir und bald erfasst uns ein Tränenfieber oder ein Lachanfall. Ferien. Es ist kalt, Juli eben. Ich stehe vor der neuen Wetterstation der neuen Schule, beobachte, wie sich die Aluminiumkegel im Wind drehen und sehe meinen Vater auf mich zukommen. Ich renne ihm entgegen und springe. Uh, hast du aber schwere Knochen, sagt er. Hart fassen seine Hände unter meine Achseln und meine Nase brennt von der kalten Luft, durch die er mich wie die Windkegel wirbelt. Ich habe nicht Geburtstag, warum ist er dann hier? Er sagt, geh und hol deine Schwester. Sie, du kommt. Jimmy sitzt schon im Auto. Ihr habt eine kleine Schwester. Wir fahren ins War Memorial Hospital. Meine neue Schwester Chiki sieht genauso aus wie ich, als ich ein Baby war, sagt Mom. Ich juble innerlich. Weil sie das zweitgeborene Mädchen ist, wird sie, wie ich mit Binyavanga, auch einen Bufumbi da Vornamen bekommen. In meiner Geburtsurkunde steht Kenneth Binyavanga Wainaina. Sie wird Kamansi heißen. Melissa Kamansi Wainaina. Wir geben ihr den Spitznamen Chiki. In unserer Familie werden wie in den meisten Jikuyo-Familien der erste Sohn und die erste Tochter nach den Großeltern väterlicherseits benannt. Der zweite Sohn und die zweite Tochter erhalten den Namen der Großeltern mütterlicherseits. Jimmy heißt James Muigai Wainaina. 
Siru heißt Jun Wanjiru Wainaina, nach Wanjiru, der Mutter meines Vaters. Ich heiße nach dem Vater meiner Mutter Binyavanga und so weiter. Dadurch wird Binyavanga zu einem jikuyu namen Wir sind also ein durcheinander gemengtes Volk. Wir haben auch ein völlig verworrenes System der Namensgebung. Das Englisch, das Englisch koloniale System, die alte jikuyu art die fremden Namen aus dem Land meiner Mutter, das wir nicht kennen. Als die Brüder und Schwestern meines Vaters in die koloniale Schule kamen, mussten sie mit einem Familiennamen antreten und sie mussten zeigen, dass sie gute Christen waren, indem sie sich einen westlichen Namen zulegten. Sie entschieden sich für Großvaters Namen als Familiennamen, Wainaina. Baba sagt, dass damals in der alten Zeit jeder mehrere Namen hatte, aus vielfältigen Gründen. Einen Namen nur für die Angehörigen deiner Altersgruppe, einen Namen als Sohn deiner Mutter, einen weiteren Namen, nachdem du zum Mann geworden warst. Heutzutage heißt man meistens so, wie es in der Geburtsurkunde steht. Ich verbringe meine gesamte Zeit in den Oberstufenjahren damit, Theaterstücke und Romane zu schreiben oder zu lesen und nach Stipendien für Amerika zu suchen. Gemeinsam mit meinem besten Freund Peter Caragna, der Romane genauso sehr liebt wie ich. Aufs Lernen gebe ich kaum etwas. Unser erfolgreichstes Stück ist ein Gerichtsdrama, das The Verdict heißt. Ich spiele Desiree, eine Prostituierte mit gutem Herzen, die sich in einen unterdrückten Jungen verliebt, der seine Mutter umbringt. Die Bühne sieht toll aus. Dafür haben wir die Kapelle geplündert. Feinster anglikanischer Samt und alte Holztische, die Gravitas ausstrahlen. Das alles in den Schulfarben Kastanienbraun und Weiß und mit aufgestickter weißer Rose. Wir gewinnen alle möglichen Preise. Im Hochgefühl des Erfolgs gründen fünf von uns eine Theatergruppe, die Changes Pisces, und inszenieren mit unserem Taschengeld ein Stück am französischen Kulturzentrum. Heimlich produzieren wir unsere Plakate und proben an verschiedenen Orten der Stadt. Die Lenana ist eine Internatsschule und es geht streng zu. Als er die Kritiken in den Zeitungen liest, schäumt der Direktor vor Wut. Wir können nicht glauben, dass wir das zu Wege gebracht haben. Nach der Schule verbringe ich ein Semester an der Kenyatta University, studiere Erziehungswissenschaft mit den Schwerpunkten französisch und englischsprachige Literatur. Der Gedanke, irgendwann mein Dasein als Lehrer zu fristen, macht mir Angst. Ein Schicksal schlimmer als Country-Musik. Gugi Watjongo ist Schriftsteller und Dramatiker, kenianischer Dramatiker. Und die Leute erzählen sich, er sage, Frauen sollten sich keine Dauerwelle machen oder Lippenstift tragen. Ich habe mir eine Dauerwelle machen lassen. Ich finde es schön. Das städtische Kenia hat eine gespaltene Persönlichkeit. Autorität, Steuerung, internationale Bürger, die Englisch sprechen. Der nationale Bruder spricht Swahili und zufrieden mit Dörfler oder nostalgische Städter unsere Muttersprachen. Nach Südafrika, das so anders ist, kommt mir hier und jetzt alles so eindeutig vor. Dort. Dort herrscht ein politischer Kampf, die bedrängten Persönlichkeiten zu befreien. Jede Sprache kämpft um ihren Platz in all dem Politischen. In diesem Teil der Stadt aber leben alle drei Kenias. Städter, die im englischsprachigen Bereich arbeiten und auf dem Nachhauseweg sind. Das Dorf mit seinen Waren und Sprachen auf den Straßen. Die ungeheuren Menschenmassen, die im Swahili sanft miteinander umgehen. Im Swahili begegnen wir einander mit Brüderlichkeit. Das ist ein Aspekt Kenias, dessen ich mir immer überaus bewusst bin, den ich herbeisehne, weil er mir völlig abgeht. Das Jikuyu, die dritte meiner Sprachen, existiert fast nicht. Ich spreche es nicht. Es ist wie ein Phantomschmerz, Kimai. Und dadurch wird mein Verlangen, diese Intelligenz und ihre Muster zu ergründen und an ihr teilzuhaben, nur noch größer. Alle Städter sind in vielen Sprachen und verschiedenen Welten zu Hause. Es gibt welche, die sechs oder sieben Sprachen sprechen. Oft hört man, dass jemand in einer anderen Sprache ein paralleles Leben führte und als er starb, ganze Familien aus dem Gebälk gekrochen kamen. Wenn, wenn der Sarg hinuntergelassen wurde, prügelten sich daneben die Witwen. Bevor ich wegging, stellte ich mir diese Dinge als Ausnahmen vor, als etwas, das mit unter einigen wenigen widerfuhr. Das stimmt nicht. Januar 1996. Ich bin wieder an der University of Trans-K. Mein neues Selbstvertrauen hält genau eine Woche an. 
Als ich mein erstes Seminar in Rechnungswesen 2 besuche, lernen wir etwas kennen, das sich getrennter Ausweis nennt. Das Rechnungswesen, so steht es im Handbuch, ist ein perzeptueller Rahmen. Aktivposten haben Passivposten. Das ist das letzte Seminar überhaupt, das ich jemals besuche. Am selben Abend gehe ich zu Malz und trinke und tanze wie ein Antilopenhase. Ich betrinke mich maßlos. Sie werfen mich aus dem Club. Ich laufe und laufe. Dann sitze ich an einem Fluss. Ich habe keine Ahnung, wie ich hier hingekommen bin. Er ist über zwei Kilometer von meinem Zimmer entfernt. Ich schluchze, meine Lungen sind wund, mir ist vor Selbstmitleid und Kotze ganz schwindelig. Eine Kuh bläst Dunst in die Luft und es riecht nach Dung. Ein Monat später schmeißt mein Vermieter mich raus. Er hat keine Lust auf eine weitere Folge meiner Abenteuer hinter verschlossener Tür. Ich verbringe Stunden online in den Computerräumen auf dem Campus. Im Netz gibt es schon hunderte Schriftstellergruppen. Ich bin bei einer Freundin untergekommen, sie heißt Silvia. Ich verdiene mir meinen höchst bescheidenen Lebensunterhalt damit, dass ich Lebensdaten in kleine Felder tippe, die anschließend laminiert zu Schülerausweisen für Oberschüler werden. Zehn Rand bekomme ich für eine Seite. Ich mache für Silvia, die an der Uni lehrt, auch den Babysitter. Nacht für Nacht sitze ich an ihrem Computer. Meine Eltern rufe ich nicht an. Ich schreibe ihnen auch nicht. Ciro ist wieder nach Hause zurück und dort auf Arbeit suche. Ich bin oft allein. Inzwischen schreibe ich jeden Tag. Manchmal schreibe ich die ganze Nacht hindurch. Nein, nein, meldet sich mein Selbstmitleid. Ich bin kein rückgratloses Klatschmaul. Es muss da einen geheimen Auftrag geben, etwas Mystisches. Vielleicht, ja vielleicht bin ich so eine Art Abiko bei Ben Okri, dieses Geisterkind in die hungrige Straße. Ich bin wie ein Eichhörnchen und durchsuche das Internet nach Möglichkeiten. Meine Geschichte Hell is in Bed with Mrs. Pepra wird von einer kleinen Zeitschrift in Amerika angenommen und ich bin in Feierstimmung. Aber ich finde heraus, dass sie erst nach Ablauf der Einsendefrist für den Kane Prize erscheinen wird. Die Zeitschrift in Nebraska kann nur in Belegtexemplaren zahlen. Völlig aufgelöst bitte ich Rod Amos einen Tag vor Ablauf der Frist, meine Mädchenkindgeschichte für mich auf g21.net zu veröffentlichen. Er antwortet, dass er keine Belletristik veröffentlicht. Ich schicke ihm schnell eine überarbeitete Fassung der Uganda-Geschichte, die in Südafrika erschienen ist. Wir beschließen sie, Discovering Home zu nennen. Rod reicht sie ein und erhält eine hochnäsige E-Mail von den Kane Prize Leuten in England, die besagt, dass sie nur Texte annehmen können, die in Druckform erschienen sind. Ich bin außer mir. Ich antworte auf die E-Mail und erkläre Ihnen, dass in den vergangenen zehn Jahren in Afrika nur eine einzige Anthologie erschienen ist. Wo wollen Sie denn Ihre gedruckten Geschichten hernehmen, frage ich. Wir antworten nicht. Scheiß auf Sie, meint Rod. Verdammte Kolonisatoren. Ja, ja, stimme ich zu. Dezember 2007. In drei Tagen sind Wahlen. Mir reicht's. Railas Party verkündet bei Versammlungen in ganz Kenia unverblümt, dass sie einen Wahlkampf von 42 Völkern gegen ein Volk, die Jikuyu, führen. Die Jikuyu sind in einigen Teilen des Rift Valley zu Schandflecken geworden. Schandflecken, die man beseitigen muss. Sie sind verrückt geworden, unsere Politiker. Fast alle Leute, die ich kenne, geben sich zum ersten Mal in unserer Geschichte offen und unverblümt als stolze Stammeszugehörige. Ich zerreiß meinen Wahlschein. Ich steige in ein Flugzeug nach Lamu, so weit weg von diesen vergifteten Wahlen wie innerhalb Kenias möglich. Der Mann, der im Flugzeug neben mir sitzt, hat ein kurzärmeliges Hemd an. Afrikanisch bedruckt. Gute Batik. Er versucht nicht damit anzugeben. Es ist von gedecktem Marineblau und er drängt seine weiße Haut nicht. Keine falschen blonden Dreadlocks. Sein Haar ist braun und kurz geschnitten. Seit zehn Minuten redet er nun schon auf mich ein. Und er irritiert mich. Vielleicht ist es das? Nee, er spricht Swahili. Und sein Swahili ist perfekt. Erst redet er Sheng, dann wechselt er in ein sauberes und wortreiches Küsten-Swahili. Mein Swahili ist nicht besonders gut. Mein Sheng ist auch nicht so gut. Vielleicht bin ich eifersüchtig. Nee, 
Das ist es auch nicht. Es liegt daran, dass er alles falsch macht. Sein Akzent ist perfekt. Sein Tonfall, der Rhythmus, einfach alles. Aber sein Timing stimmt nicht. In diesem Land mit seinen vielen Sprachen, Klassen und Stammbüchern wird vieles dadurch gesagt, indem man es nicht sagt. Es gibt viele selbstverständliche Wege, jemanden anzusprechen. Manchmal wechselt man schnell ins Englische. Oftmals spricht man in einem spöttelten Swahili mit ironischem Unterton, einfach um zu zeigen, dass man es mit der Sprache nicht so dogmatisch hält, dass man froh ist, zwischen den Sprachen zu wechseln und die Bandbreite der Person, mit der man sich unterhält, herauszufinden. Der Mann ist ein Dogmatiker und seine ausgesprochene Höflichkeit nichts als Rüde. Er will, dass ich ihm für seine kulturelle Gewissenhaftigkeit dankbar bin und mir nicht erlauben, Englisch zu sprechen oder, oder gar nichts zu sagen. Ich bin kein Individuum, ich bin ein Kulturbotschafter. Sein korrektes Swahili verlangt von mir, dass ich aufmerksamer bin, als ich es sein möchte. Unaufmerksamkeit schickt sich nicht, wenn jemand formelles Swahili spricht. Das verlangt Brüderlichkeit und Respekt. Nicken muss ich und sagen, Dio, ah, äh, ja, oh, die Augen in geheucheltem Interesse weit aufgerissen, die Augenbrauen hochgezogen. Das wird ein langer Flug. General Service findet man ganz einfach auf Mittelwelle. Auf der Skala genau bei 800. National Service ist irgendwo bei 200. Das weiß ich, weil ich mir alle Mühe gebe, den Sender mit seinen kimai klängen so weit wie irgend möglich zu meiden. Ich habe keine Ahnung, warum mir diese Kongo-Musik und die schlechte kenianische Gitarrenmusik derart auf die Nerven gehen. Es ist einfach so. Die Wahrheit ist, dass ich es nicht so mit Bildern habe. Mit Wörtern bin ich viel besser. In einem Buch sind jede Berührung und jeder Kuss sehr machtvoll. Im Fernsehen oder im Kino empfinde ich nicht dasselbe. Filme sind für alle da. Sie lassen dich empfinden, was die ganze zuschauende Welt empfindet. Was den Film angeht, so bin ich Außenseiter, ein Zeuge, der das Schauspiel bestaunt, das sich vor seinen Augen entfaltet. Die erotische Welt des Romans erwacht nicht auf einem Bildschirm zum Leben, auf Glas und Plastik und Metall. Sie entsteht auch nicht auf der Seite zum Leben. Dort stehen nur Schnörkel, die mit billigen Mitteln auf ein Stück totes Holz gestempelt wurden. Die ganze Welt eines Romans entfaltet sich erst in einem Kopf aus Ängste verschränkt mit dem stechenden Blick, der beengten Brust, dem rumpelnden Magen. Sie ist ganz und gar mein, zu 100% privat. Wenn sie sich berühren oder küssen, dann gehört dieser Kuss mir. Er gehört keineswegs den anderen Lesern, dem Autor, dem Paar. Wenn es ein gut geschriebener Kuss ist, dann wird er zu dem kleinen, gewundenen Ort unter dem festen Knochen hinter meinen Brustwarzen. Manchmal frage ich mich, ob es eine dritte Art Menschen gibt. Das sind zum einen die Menschen aus Fleisch und Blut. Dann gibt es die Menschen im Fernsehen und im Radio. Und es gibt Menschen, die kommen in Büchern vor. Die Menschen in den Büchern haben keine Stimme, die man hören kann. Man kann sie nicht sehen. Du, der Leser, Arbeitest mit einem guten Schriftsteller zusammen, damit sie dir durch den Kopf gehen, wieder und wieder, das Haar schütteln, hassen und lieben und Dinge dringend benötigen. Horst Braun ist ein Gefühl in mir, das daher rührt, dass ich über Pferde und Mähnen und Wehen des Haar und Herbst gelesen habe. Eine Anordnung von Eindrücken, Bewegungen, Licht. Das sind meine Anliegen. Dankeschön. Danke, Dennis. Wunderbar. Und danke euch allen. Und danke, Kirsten, für die Organisation des Abends. Du hast deinen Namen selbst nicht genannt, aber Kirsten Maas Aber hat diesen Abend heute organisiert. Mein Name ist Uli Schreiber. Ich leite das Internationale Literaturfestival in Berlin. 
Und äh, ich freue mich sehr, dass äh, ich Manfred Metzner vorstellen kann. Manfred Metzner äh, sitzt hier, weil er ein Buch veröffentlicht hat. Äh, eines Tages werde ich über diesen Ort schreiben. Äh, das Buch von Binyawanga. Und äh, er ist aber nicht nur Verleger seit 40 Jahren, äh, leitet er äh, mit anderen zusammen, auch den äh, Wunderhorn Verlag, sondern hat auch äh, viele Jahre lang äh, eine äh, Stiftung, äh, einer Stiftung vorgestanden, die, der Kurt-Wolf-Stiftung von 2000 bis 2010. Die kümmert sich auch um kleinere Verlage äh, im deutschsprachigen Raum. Und, äh, aber wie gesagt, seit 40 Jahren macht er diesen Wunderhorn Verlag. Mir ist er zum ersten Mal aufgefallen, als er äh, Abdel Wahab Medeb äh, publizierte und später dann Edouard Glissant, der im Jahr 2007 äh, die Eröffnungsrede bei unserem Festival hielt. Und äh, naja, aber äh, ich habe wirklich gestaunt, das war mir gar nicht so klar. Es sind ja weit über 20 äh, äh, Autoren, die er in seinem Afrika-Programm hat, äh, welche außer Binyawanga, welche Autoren bei ihm mittlerweile verlegt werden. Das ist Helen Habila. Ähm, Lebogang Maschile, ähm, äh, Susan Kigurli, Masa Mengiste, Mia Koto, Ben Okri und Jaki, Ismail Bea, ähm, Osundu und Elnathan John und viele mehr. Das ist schon sehr beachtlich, äh, vor allem wenn man weiß, dass sich ja solche nicht so bekannten Autoren äh, wie die Nobelpreisträger, die ja auch zum Teil aus Afrika kommen, eben Ole Soinka oder auch äh, Nadim Gordima, John Kutzi, äh, dass sie sich nicht so schnell verkaufen wie eben diese äh, berühmten Autoren. Ja, ähm, Manfred äh, und ich, ach so, vielleicht darf ich das auch noch erwähnen, äh, ich äh, sitze hier nicht nur, weil ich das Festival leite, sondern weil ich äh, Bin Yawanga auch äh, kennenlernen durfte. In den Mitte der Nullerjahre habe ich ihn in New York getroffen zum ersten Mal und bin dann gleich auf ihn neu, bin dann gleich neugierig geworden und habe ihn dann 2009 einladen können. Nach zwei Jahren, zwei Jahre vorher konnte er nicht, aber 2009 war er zum ersten Mal zu Gast in Berlin und, und dann zweites Mal 2016 äh, vor drei Jahren also. Aber Manfred, äh, ich habe ein paar Fragen vorbereitet. Erste Frage ist natürlich, wie bist du an äh, Binyawanga gekommen? Wie, oder erstmal zu der Reihe Wunderhorn Afrika. Ja, ja auch nochmal herzlichen Dank an die Böll-Stiftung, dass Sie mich hier eingeladen haben. Das ist mir auch ähm, eine ganz große Ehre, dass ich an diesem Tag hier mit Ihnen zusammen Binyawanga wenn einer ehren darf. Ich äh, möchte noch darauf hinweisen, dass ähm, eines Tages werde ich über diesen Ort schreiben, von Tobias Brückner ins Deutsche übersetzt worden ist. Sie haben ja gehört, wie großartig er äh, den Ton auch äh, von äh, Binja Wanga getroffen hat. Äh, und das ist auch ein Teil, glaube ich, ähm, was bei Wunderhorn besonders ist, dass wir eben für alle Übersetzungen, wir machen sehr, sehr viele Übersetzungen, nicht nur von afrikanischen Autorinnen und Autoren, sondern auch aus der französischen Karibik äh, oder äh, aus Indien, äh, dass wir da immer nur die besten Übersetzerinnen und Übersetzer äh, suchen und auch finden, weil Sie wissen das alle, äh, ein Roman, der aus einer anderen Sprache ins Deutsche übersetzt wird, steht und fällt mit einer wirklich guten Übersetzung und nicht mit einer so Larifari, äh, mal schnell übersetze ich das. Ja, wie bin ich äh, zu Binji, wie wir uns untereinander <lacht> verständigt haben, ja, war Binji für mich äh, gekommen. Ähm, es wurde schon gesagt, dass äh, vor 40 Jahren habe ich den Wunderhorn Verlag in Heidelberg gegründet und ähm, ein Motto dieses Verlages war und ist es bis heute, die Erneuerung der Literaturen kommt aus den Peripherien und nicht aus den Metropolen. Und darauf baut sich seit 1978 mein Verlagsprogramm auf, das ein sehr internationales Verlagsprogramm ist, das nicht nur Prosa umfasst, sondern auch sehr viel Poesie. Wir machen eine ganz große, zwei große, drei große Poesiereihen, wo wir internationale Poeten in Deutschland 
in deutsche Übersetzung vorstellen. Wir machen auch Sachbücher und auch Kunst. Aber das besondere Glück für mich war 1982, das kann man sich nicht ausdenken als Verleger, als kleiner Verleger. Ich habe mit zwei, mit drei Büchern angefangen. Das waren die ersten Titel, die ich 1978 veröffentlicht hatte. Das besondere Glück war für mich, dass ich schon 1982 den großen Kulturphilosophen Edouard Glissant aus Martinique kennengelernt habe und sein deutscher Verleger 1983 geworden bin. Und äh, das ist im Prinzip eigentlich auch der Ausgangspunkt meiner ganzen weiteren äh, Überlegungen, welche Literaturen dieser Welt möchte ich hier in deutscher Übersetzung präsentieren. Dazu kommt, dass ich mich immer schon auch als Student in den 1970er Jahren, einige von Ihnen erinnern sich dunkel äh, noch an die 1970er Jahre, das waren, eine ganz, waren ganz bewegte Zeiten, und da befassten wir uns ja auch schon als junge Studenten, sozusagen, die hieß damals noch internationale Solidarität. Und ähm, ich habe da auch äh, sehr viel in Heidelberg in dieser Richtung in verschiedenen Gruppen gearbeitet. Und es gab auch in, in Europa äh, Unabhängigkeitsbewegungen. Und ich habe ungefähr ein Jahr in Montpellier in Südfrankreich in den 70er Jahren in der okzitanischen Unabhängigkeits äh, Bewegung gearbeitet. Viele wissen das bis heute nicht mehr, dass es ja auch in Frankreich die bretonische, elsässische und okzitanische Unabhängigkeitsbewegung gab. Diese Regionen wollten selbstständig werden, sich von Frankreich, vom französischen Staat sozusagen selbstständig machen. Also das ist ein Thema für mich, was immer wichtig war. Und mit Edouard Clisson kam dazu, dass dieser wunderbare Philosoph ja der Erste war, der sich seit, äh, mit in seinem ganzen Werk mit der Kreolisierung der Welt beschäftigt hat. Ich will das nicht weiter ausführen, aber ähm, was er damit auch unter anderem angestoßen hat, und das war für mich wiederum das Wichtige und für alle, die sich mit Edouard Glissant beschäftigt haben, war, dass er derjenige war, der den postkolonialen Diskurs begann in Frankreich mit seinen Büchern, mit seiner Theorie über die Grillisierung der Welt und der uns auf diese Spur gesetzt hat, äh, als Intellektuelle uns mit diesen Themen auch in Deutschland zu beschäftigen. Nochmal, also Thema Wunder in Afrika, wie kam es dazu? Und äh, ja. das Zweite ist, wie kam dann äh, Binja Wanga in deinen Verlag? Ja, das äh, ist genau eben äh, die Geschichte, die mit Glissant und der Kreolisierung der Welt zusammenhängt und mit dieser Kulturphilosophie und mit dem rhizomatischen Denken. Äh, dann kam Abdel Wahab Medeb, den du schon äh, erwähnt hast, und der Maghreb dazu. Wir haben uns dann sehr intensiv auch äh, mit den Literaturen aus dem Maghreb beschäftigt. Und dann war es eigentlich konsequent, sich mit subsahara afrika zu beschäftigen. Und als wir die Reihe begonnen haben und die Herausgeberin Indra Wusso, die lebt in Johannesburg, die ähm, sozusagen uns auch mit in die Diskussion gebracht hat, äh, dass wir diese Reihe einrichten bei Wunderhorn Afrika, Wunderhorn, äh, da war es dann äh, folgendermaßen, dass sie natürlich in großen deutschen Verlagen afrikanische Literaturen veröffentlicht bekommen haben, auch lesen konnten, aber es trat was ein bei den Verlagen in Deutschland, die afrikanische Autorinnen und Autoren veröffentlicht haben, dass sie vergessen haben, dass es eine jüngere Generation in Afrika gibt. Junge Autoren, junge Künstler, junge Musiker, die äh, dort äh, ein ganz anderes Denken auch entwickelt hatten, ein ganz anderes Schreiben, andere Performance und, und, und. Und das war eigentlich der Ausgangspunkt äh, dieser Reihe Afrika Wunderhorn zu entwickeln, um hier im deutschen Sprachraum zu zeigen, dass es ein ganz, ganz, ganz anderes Afrika gibt als dieses, was bisher in den Medien oder auch in der Literatur transportiert wurde. Und so begannen wir 2010, im Jahr erscheinen drei Titel von äh, afrikanischen Autorinnen und Autoren bei Wunderhorn. Und äh, Binja Wanga hatte ja 2011 äh, One Day I Will Write About This Place veröffentlicht. Und wir haben uns dann sofort um die deutschen Rechte gekümmert. Und so ist dieses Buch 2013 bei Wunderhorn erschienen. Und ähm, ich habe dann Binja Wanga äh, persönlich eben 
erst kennengelernt bei diesem großen Kongress in Bayreuth. Da war ja vorher auch schon die Sprache, die Sprache von diesem großen Besäufnis <lacht> beim ALA-Kongress in Bayreuth. Ähm, ich habe nicht an dieser Nacht teilgenommen. <lacht> Ich saß vielmehr mit Binji äh, in einem Biergarten schon ab Nachmittags und wir haben da die wunderbarsten Dinge besprochen. Ähm, dann haben wir auch, das ist auch ein Teil unserer Arbeit für diese Afrika Wunderhorn-Reihe, dass wir unsere Autorinnen und Autoren immer versuchen, zu deutschsprachigen Festivals zu bekommen, nach Deutschland einzuladen, dass sie hier auftreten können oder wir sie auch auffordern, dass sie sich für ein Stipendium beim DAAD bewerben sollen. Und Binja Wanga hatte dann das Glück, dass er dieses Stipendium bekommen hat und war dann eben 2016, 17 hier in Berlin. Äh, zu Berlin ist zu sagen, äh, das war sicherlich eine sehr schlimme Zeit für ihn. Nach weil, einigen Herz ja, mit, bzw. Mit Schlaganfällen. Vielen Schlaganfällen, aber, und äh, das müssen Sie sich vorstellen, ähm, er hatte quasi, er musste seine Sprache wieder lernen. Das kam überhaupt noch nicht zur Sprache, dass es ihm so schlecht ging, dass er seine Sprache wieder lernen musste. Durch diese Schlaganfälle war er zum Teil gelähmt und das war alles hier in Berlin. Ja, hat er hier gemacht und ich habe ihn dermaßen bewundert, wie er auch mit diesem großen Problem, dem gesundheitlichen, wenn wir zusammen essen gegangen sind, dann müssen Sie sich das vorstellen, wenn wir miteinander gesprochen haben, dass das sehr langsam und sehr laut war und er auch kaum essen konnte. Aber er hat es gemacht, er hat sich dieser Öffentlichkeit auch so gestellt, wie er, nachdem er sein Outing hatte im Januar 2014, da hatte ich ihn dann sofort angerufen und Sie können diesen Text bei uns auf der Webseite nachlesen, diesen Text, wo er sich outet als homosexuell. Und ich habe gesagt, wenn irgendwas schief läuft oder dann, weißt du, dann kannst du immer nach Heidelberg kommen, du hast immer einen Platz dort. Ja. Aber, und das war das Bewundernswerte und so war er, und das war eben diese große Stärke, die er hatte und die auch Auswirkungen hat bis heute, er sagte sofort, nein, ich bleibe in Afrika, die sollen mich sehen, die sollen sich mit mir auseinandersetzen, ich gehe nicht weg. Er ist ein Jahr nicht aus Afrika weg um sich dort auch zu zeigen. Also er war ein, für mich ein wahnsinnig mutiger Mensch, ähm, ein unglaublich kreativer Mensch, so wie es ja auch schon beschrieben wurde. Ähm, haben wir viele Projekte gesponnen, aus denen viel nichts geworden ist. Ähm, und ähm, ich warte auch noch auf sein zweites großes Buch. Ja, das ist natürlich leider jetzt auch nicht mehr möglich. Aber wie er seine Zeit genutzt hat, ja, und, und ähm, er war dann auch in die Siglite Geisel, sitzt hinten, freut mich auch, oh. dass äh, sie da ist. Sie war ja auch mit Binge hier äh, in äh, Berlin unterwegs und wir haben dann in Heidelberg einen ganz wunderbaren Abend äh, mit Binja Wanga und Siglite Geisel äh, äh, gemacht und das Buch nochmal dort vorgestellt. Wie, wie war denn die Reaktion auf das Buch? Also ich habe zwei Rezensionen, glaube ich, in der Süddeutschen gelesen und im Tagesspiegel. Mhm. Nicht so üppig äh, angesichts ja. der Power dieses Buches? Ja, das ist äh, nochmal ein ganz anderes Kapitel, da müssen wir nochmal sehr lange drüber sprechen. Die sozusagen Rezeption afrikanischer Autorinnen und Autoren in Deutschland. Sicherlich ähm, findet die statt. Es gibt immer mehr, Gott sei Dank, in deutscher Übersetzung. Ähm, aber äh, ich glaube einfach, äh, dass sich das bis jetzt nicht umsetzt äh, in Buchkauf zum Beispiel und in einer dauerhaften Präsenz. Also wir müssen auch in dieser Buchreihe äh, jedes Mal aufs Neue wirklich 1000 Prozent fahren, um den oder diejenige in den Medien platzieren zu können oder zu Festivals oder, oder, oder. Also es ist noch nicht so weit gelungen, dass sozusagen man von einem kommerziellen Erfolg sprechen könnte, außer du bekommst den Nobelpreis. Das ist äh, ja vorher auch schon erwähnt worden. Aber die Qualität aller Autorinnen und Autoren, die hier publiziert werden, ist so hoch. Und ich vermute insgeheim, und es ist ja auch so, wenn Sie die äh, Feuilletons zum Beispiel anschauen, es wird immer weniger, was Buchbesprechungen äh, in den Feuilletons gemacht wird. Und es wird eben nicht dann darauf Wert gelegt, dass man Autorinnen und Autoren aus Afrika zu zuvörderst vielleicht bespricht oder einen Film über sie dreht oder, oder, oder. Also da ist noch äh, ein großes Stück Arbeit äh, vor uns. 
Äh, ich bin aber dankbar äh, all denen, auch hier in Berlin äh, oder jetzt auch in Stuttgart, dass es afrikanische Literaturfestivals gibt. Das ist ja auch eine ganz neue Entwicklung, die unter anderem sicherlich auch damit zusammenhängt, dass sagen wir mal, dieser interkulturelle und dieser postkoloniale Diskurs, inzwischen soll man ja nicht mehr, ist das ja schon viel, viel, viel weiter gekommen, was diesen Diskurs angeht, dass er angekommen ist. Ja, und dass wir da immer mehr Möglichkeiten schaffen, dass das auch hier im deutschsprachigen Raum weiter ankommt und diskutiert wird. Gut, danke Manfred Metzner. Das wäre dann dieses Gespräch. Der nächste Tagesordnungspunkt kommt bald. Aber ich wollte noch ein eine kleine Anekdote erzählen. Ähm, er kam ja 2009 äh, zum Festival und ähm, ich wusste, irgendwann nachmittags würde er ähm, ins, ins Zelt kommen. Wir haben so ein Festivalzelt und äh, er kam ungefähr eine halbe Stunde, Stunde eher. Warum? Weil er sich eine Stunde nachdem er gelandet äh, ist in Berlin ein äh, Fahrrad lieh, mit dem er dann in den fol folgenden Tagen äh, Berlin eroberte. Das fand ich sehr bemerkenswert. Auf jeden Fall habe ich das noch nicht erlebt. Immerhin hatte ich, hatten wir 2000 Gäste. Danke. Vielen Dank. Dear Baba, we've been needing to talk. We haven't really had a chance to talk since you died, three years ago, and I thought today would be a good day. Of course, you may be aware that, Mum, we had a conversation in January uh, with Mum. There is nothing that is a priority about being a homosexual and being an African. But there is everything that every African has to defend, every kind of diversity we carry as an African, even when you do not understand it. For me, what has come to be is to arrive at this place where I am living in plain night. I am not living in a dark continent. I will stand free the way I need to be as a moral being on the continent, and nobody will stop me from going where I will. And if you decide to, I will go through you, or you will stop me. We cannot think of our continent as a hostile place. Too many of us have learned to fear it. And I feel that if you trust it, engage with it, and be involved with it in the conversations of building as adventurers, that this continent will start to sing to us again. That's all I have to say. I am five years old. He stood there in overalls, awkward, his chest a railway track of sweaty bumps and little hard beads of hair. Everything about him is smooth, slow. Bits of brown on a cracked tooth, that endless long smile. Good thing for me, the slow way he moves, because I'm transparent to people's patterns and can trip so easily and fall into snarls and fear with jerky people. A long, easy smile. He lifts me in the air and swings. He smells of diesel and the world of all other people's movements has disappeared. I am away from everybody for the first time in my life and it is glorious. And then it is a tunnel of fear. There are no creeks in him. Like a tractor, he will climb any hill steadily. If he walks away now with me, I will go with him forever. If he puts me down, my legs will not move again. 
I'm so ashamed. I stop myself from clinging. I jump away from him and avoid him forever. For 20 something years, I even hug men awkwardly. There will be this feeling again, stronger, firmer now, aged maybe seven, once with another slow, easy golfer at Nakuru Golf Club, and I'm shaking because he shook my hand. Then I'm crying alone in the toilet because a repeat of this feeling has made me suddenly ripped apart and lonely. The feeling is not sexual. It is certain. It is overwhelming. It wants to make a home. It comes every few months like a bout of malaria and leaves me shaken for days and confused for months. I do nothing about it. I am five, when I close myself into a vague happiness that asks for nothing much from anybody, absent-minded, sweet. I'm grateful for all love. I give it more than I receive it often. I can be selfish. I masturbate a lot and never allow myself to crack and grow my heart. I touch no men. I read books. I love my dad so much, my heart is learning to stretch. I am a homosexual. Thank you. Everything will be quite, quite excellent in 2050, past, deadline, past the deadline and with jet lag, I decide to sleep. I got into JFK yesterday at midday, and the late afternoon I woke up in that perfect zone, fuzzy and vague, which is as close to being Audrey Lord matched up with James Baldwin as I can humanly get. To get into deep Audrey Lord in 2050, the world will all, sorry, the oil will all be stretched out one molecule thick, but tougher than a spider web, and it will be some nanotechnology all into and all over each other. I didn't like that idea. In 2050, all the globe will be inside fully the politics of Audrey Lord and James Baldwin. We will carry everybody and their pain, but their love, and even the internet of all things, will have done various editions of deeper and deeper and deeper, more than these bad days of 2015, which are shallow. This idea is not working. To make this Baldwin, Baldwin Audrey Lord place work in this narrative, a lot of bleeding and killing has to happen between now and 2050. But that now makes me scared that this is ending up like the Game of Thrones. Because <laughs> we all know winter is coming and all that. Like Garissa and Westgate and the migrants last week drowning in the Mediterranean and fuck, fuck the EU and fuck, fuck France, Africa. Okay. I take a nap and chew a cookie. Jacob, the hotel is nice, by the way. I am happy to be far away from this New York. I used to live in upstate New York and have missed it. Kenya is a different kind of accountable. For people here over beer, I not, I not really call it being their power bottoming. So last night, scared of loving something enough to start this piece, I ended up on Facebook and Twitter. Our vice president, a man whose kidneys always seem to be cruising us on a slow motion towards a genocide, decided to point his finger, this time at homosexuals. 
And in, the good, this, and in this good tradition of avoiding this deadline, I dove right in on social media until 6 o'clock this morning. <laughs> it is 2 p.m. this afternoon, and this man came up to me. He has a nice, sorry, he has a nice three-day Iranian stubble, 50 years from now, in Tehran. He has a Zoroastrian way about him. I mean, by this, he feels safe because that shit is old. Zoroastra. I was once told by a very smart European architecture type that when there is shit in the world, it will always be good to hide out in a beautiful ruin. The kind has be, that has been there and done that. He meant like Italy, you know, where buildings crumble and you want to eat them like cake, and the museum wears nice sweaters and shoes, and who cares about, you know, whatever. I think that's what he meant. And most certainly, Kenya, sorry, is 100 years old in 2050. And being there and doing that in ways that makes the economist very happy and James Baldwin very upset indeed. He wasn't that kind of blue collar, the 2050 Iranian, I mean. I promise that melty feeling was most certainly not just his hairy forearms. Over 35, over, over these 35 years, I have stretched out politically and in my body and soul. I've triggered all my permutations, examined my inner me's. I have outgrown the rag, uh, sorry. I've outgrown hot men. <laughs> With raw asphalt stomachs like asphalt just before it dries or is melting and grainy in a movie set in a hot place. Then they wipe the stomach. So, comma, many, comma, many, comma, many people are dying. So we just sit there in Tehran before the panel the sky is wide and high with metal and things thrusting and twisted into shapes of arrival, you know, to the center of the world, like New York then, this Tehran now. I knew I was grateful that he pulled me into his cigarette break outside the conference. I'm really hoping he takes me home. Like everybody, now I'm tired and don't really know why and I really, really want somebody with enough solid stubborn in him to hold me tight and gruffly with a lot of hard stubble and tongue in my ear to say, stay, stay still, stay here. Hello once again. Uh, so a lot of my poetry is very heavy, right? So I thought tonight we might just end up, just end on a very lighter love note. Um, may this day remind you of beautiful things, like those summer nights you strode the lonely streets hand in hand, giving them life. Oh, sorry. Uh, in this poem, may we all pretend that we are women, so that the poem, so I don't have to shift between he, she, he, you know. So at, at this point, we just all sisters, we just all, you know. May this day remind you of all, may this day remind you of summer nights you walked on those lonely streets hand in hand, giving them life, like those mon sex scented mornings you couldn't stop gazing into each other's eyes. Home well cooked meals, red wine, sunset you witnessed, bathing moments you shared, scrubbing each other's feet. Like on that morning, you got yourself a bracelet, engraved his name, and you vowed that you'd never take it off. 
but may this day also remind you of sour moments, like finding out that he wasn't ready to commit in that relationship, like on that night when he didn't come for you at the bus depot after he'd been away for a year, like on many occasions he chose beer binging with his friends than being with you. On many occasions he hung up your phone calls because you were too drunk to be in his senses, like that Sunday afternoon he called you by her name, whilst on top of you, making some good loving. But may this day remind you of all beautiful things that you are, you, woman, a goddess, who holds power to mend broken hearts with eyes that heal sacred wounds, with hands that blesses whatever they touch, you, woman, with shoulders to carry heavy burdens, a strong back to bundle babies, you, woman. Tell me, would you have really wanted to be stuck with your ex? The one who didn't come for you? I don't think so. Really, would you have really wanted to be stuck with him? I don't think so. The one who didn't come for you after being away for a year? I don't think so. Tell me, didn't your last relationship teach you something about yourself? Didn't you find out how strong you are? Aren't you listening to new music now because of him? Maybe it wasn't supposed to be with him. Didn't you find a hair that is making you happy now? Tell me, may this day remind you of all beautiful things you are and that each relationship that didn't work, it wasn't supposed to work. So may this day remind you of all beautiful things that you are. Thank you. Linda, thank you very much. Um, we are on our last uh, point uh, for this evening, which is a sharing space. We are going to go about 10 to 15 minutes. So anyone who wants to come and share memories of Binya, uh, we are gathering around Binya's big, beautiful, motherful, midwifing, radical inclusionist soul. And um, um, we invite short statements. There's a microphone here. I'm going to put it down in a second when I'm done. Uh, you can do your statements in uh, any language. If we don't understand, then it's still okay. <laughs> it's about the spirit. There's also a Zal Mikro, as far as I can see, or is it for us? It's for you. It's for me. It's for the phone, I guess. So, oh, we, we, we already have two. Um, yeah, so to start us off, we, we can also uh, engage with Yvonne a little bit further. If there were questions that you wanted to ask uh, Yvonne before and you couldn't ask them. Um, and I also want to ask Nadia Ofuete Alizad. You organized, you were the main force behind the organizing of the ALA conference in Bayreuth. So I outed you on the party. Maybe I should out you on the official part as well. And uh, you just organized the second time, for the second time, the literature festival um, with an, a perspective of Ar African heritage, uh, Afrolution. Is it over yet? It's over? Okay, it's always so short. Everything in Berlin is so short at times. It was my birthday weekend, otherwise I would have been, I would have come a little bit more, but I was kind of doing birthday things, so yeah. Uh, so that's Nadia of Fuerte Alizad. If you'd like to say anything, uh, you're also very welcome to say something. Well, uh, happy belated birthday. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> By Afrolution 2019. So we are just now slowly coming out of it, and that's why I'm still wearing my glasses. Um, yeah, the title was Pan Africanism Revisited, Pan Africanism Revised. And so, in a way, it's very fitting for me. It makes a lot of sense uh, for me to stand here. Um, I just checked my phone, not to check my phone, but to check the last messages that I had exchanged with Binyavanga. And uh, it, my messages don't load in here because the internet is not really good. So I couldn't pull it up. But one of the last messages was like, save the date, we are going to party. <laughs> um, that was when he was here in Berlin. Um, and you're right, there was this night in Bayreuth at uh, ALA, the annual conference of the African Literature Association, 
African Futures and Beyond was the title, and Binya Vanga was actually one of the keynote speakers. And uh, he surely, I mean, when you organize, a, I was one of the conveners, when you organize a conference, you obviously in touch with the speakers, you agree on certain themes, there's like a whole choreography. So uh, when Binya Vanga uh, arrived and held his keynote, he gave a completely different keynote <laughs> than the one that we had agreed upon. Um, from an organizer point of view, Abinya Vanga was a nightmare. <laughs> he was a pain in the ass, but still we partied that night. I didn't stay until eight in the morning, but I tried to sort of control them before I finally went to sleep to get ready for, no, it didn't work. <laughs> and he really, you know, gave us a bad reputation at that particular Bayreuth hotel, but that is not uh, difficult in Bayreuth to really mess up your reputation, so I'm still absolutely fine uh, with that. And um, Binya passed on the 21st of May and I received the message from Yvonne because we, I was already in Stuttgart where we were uh, preparing uh, for Membrane Festival. Yvonne and Felvin Saar and myself were curators and so the message hit me uh, on the 22nd, early in the morning. And then we began uh, that festival on the 23rd. And in a way, I felt throughout that gathering of artists and thinkers and authors um, from the African continent and the African diasporas, in a way, I felt Binya really wanted to be there, you know. And so he hurried up some. And he was really uh, present with us. And there was a lot of sharing. There was a lot of emotion. So for me, that was sort of the beginning of that um, month or so of grieving, and um, so I'm really glad uh, to be here with you tonight. And I'm really a bit sad that only so few people showed up. So I don't know what that means. And what the message of his death m triggered in me was really like a, a, a somewhat deep shame, because uh, I was, I think, maybe quite German around Binya Vanga, and I didn't want to intervene too much. So when I saw him at ALA, ALA I, I already saw that he was not well. He was spiraling into some kind of uh, frenzy. You know, he, he arrived with a bottle of whiskey and he left without it. Um, so he was partying hard. And sometimes I felt that he was being consumed by a particular culture. He had a particular role in the West that I did not like so much. Um, he was sort of like, in German, we say Vorzeige uh, homosexueller from Africa. Um, that's like, a, is that a word? Can you translate that? What he became, he, he was like a token gay homosexual African. And so he had to perform that role because uh, the, the, the Western gaze on Africa talks about that Africa per se is homophobic and there's a certain construction going on. And I really didn't like um, the idea of one of our finest getting sucked into that and having to perform that role. And I think um, um, I really felt that I should have uh, taken him aside and, and spoken to him that he needed to find some rest and he needed to find some safe spaces. Um, so yeah, and I'm still like sort of struggling with that uh, with that feeling. Yeah. Nadia, thank you so much. It's it's obviously very many conflicting feelings. Thank you, first of all. It's many conflicting feelings. I think death obviously also uh, um, uh, uh, kind of also activates a feeling of guilt. Um, and and uh, uh, for me, uh, uh, that's that's why uh, um, um, thank you for all the different videos of Binya because there's nothing that we can uh, there's nothing that that can take the place of Binya speaking directly because you see all the passion, but also dancing with death. Yvonne, you were saying before we, we we came into the room about how many strokes Binya had, and about how he showed you his brain scan, and and told you I'm not going to repeat. I'm not an author, so I'm not going to go anywhere near how you described it. If you want to describe, you can describe. But in, in any case, the fe our fear of, my fear of death, let me start with myself, uh, engaging with, with, with Binya and, and, and listening to, to, to what, what his life was like 
with the danger of a stroke was, it made me gasp because I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of death. But being afraid of death is even, uh, uh, it, what we're actually behind that is we're afraid of life. And Binya lived like to the hilt. So for that, for that reason, I think that part is unapologetic. I did question myself as a friend uh, uh, drinking uh, uzo nectar with him. But on the other hand, life is so uncontrollable, it can be, it's, it's really, it's, it's terrifying, but it can be over and really fast, and it can be over even if we do, in Anführungszeichen, all the right things. So there's guilt and there's never a right answer. And, 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 and all we can do is, is, is uh, uh, gather around Binya's huge spirit with all our conflicting feelings and speak them out. So I want to say two more things and then kind of uh, um, ask if, if there are any more statements. And I'd like you to have the last word, Yvonne. So what I'm going to say is um, one thing, the last, the pen uh, um, a video of Binya saying, Many of us are so afraid, we've been taught to be so afraid of this continent, to fear this continent. And I'm speaking to Africans and diaspora and Africans now. And uh, when he said, trust this continent, I like that. So, um, yeah, Yvonne, you're nodding, because I know that South African connection is strong in your case as well. So um, that's also, there's a messiness there, and, 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 and I can't put it into any other terms than just say, that's a deep inspiration. It was just good to see Binya speaking again. And the second thing I want to say, I asked all the, the um, contributors for today if we can do that because the black community in uh, Berlin and the black community in Germany asked me um, when we speak about Binya to speak about Fidelis Lucas Maria Grotke. And now I'm emotional. So Fidelis was born in 1962 and he passed the day before Binya. And uh, they were very similar in very many ways. Lovers of literature, lovers of Africanness, motherships, messy people. And um, Fidelis is one of the midwives of our community in Germany. And um, very much like Binya, he was drinking red wine when I visited him in the hospital uh, after he, he, he was, his, his cancer had metastasized everywhere. He was eating waffles out of a plastic bag, <laughs> drinking red wine. And then he poured red wine on his hospital shirt. And then he was tipping it away because I said, you have a, a red a hot wine fleck. And then he said, do you think anyone sees it? I'm like, yeah, Fidelis. Everyone sees your damn red wine. <laughs> he was drinking red wine out of piccolo bottles that he bought down in the urban Krankenhaus, if anyone knows the urban. Life is absurd. It's about pain and love and loss. I feel guilty in all cases. They're all going to be missed. Yvonne. I don't want to cut off anyone who wants to say something about, about Binya. If, if anyone wants to come up and say something about Binya, I don't want to overlook you. We'll take the time. There are also refreshments, by the way. You can come up or you can have a microphone. I have been mentioned before, I'm Siglinde Geisel, and I had these readings with Binyawanga after his debilitating stroke. And of course, I mean, it was something of a nightmare for a moderator when you're not sure if you understand the author in the discussion, and I kind of tried to translate. So we met before in this famous tent at the Literatur Festival, and Binyawanga told me, you know, I'm so nervous, it's going to be my first reading after the debilitating strokes. And so we just decided we'll, we'll just ask the audience to help us. So I told them, you know, it's difficult to understand him. He has this speech problem. And just help us when you understand something that I don't, then just shout in. And so everybody was sitting on the, the edge of their chairs. And it was so intense. And then a miracle happened. Because Binyavanga's speech got much, much better because he felt the attention. And he wanted to tell people wha what was happening. It was so interesting and so intense. And it was just best speech therapy for him to speak to people. And afterwards, so many people, those 50 people who were there, I'm sure everybody was so touched. And it was a very special moment. And that's just, you know, that was so wonderful. And Binyavanga, I just thought when I saw him speaking without his um, impediment, he was so powerful and at the same time so fragile. This is such a, a rare thing to have witnessed. So I'm very thankful for having known him. Gesine, thank you very much. Uh, um, that again is is about Binya's radical inclus inclu inclus inclusionist spirit. Um, 
that that's what that reminds me of. And a paradox human being, extremely strong and extremely fragile. Are there any more statements that I'm over overlooking? Oh, they're refreshments, by the way. They're downstairs. Uh, when you walk downstairs uh, to your right side, so we can also talk about uh, uh, over refreshments if uh, you don't get the chance to say what you want to say here. But I'm going to like do one more awkward, <laughs> one more awkward like screening just everyone looking into everyone's eyes and seeing if anyone wants to say anything, anything at all. No. In the last rows, I don't want to say anything. Okay, Yvonne, you have the last word. Well, actually, I'm going to give Binyavanga the last word. So uh, if you will uh, bear with me, I'm going to ask us to please stand. Let's give him a 30 second uh, silence of remembering in whatever way um, and leave it. And that's, that's the end of it. Yeah, 30 seconds. Let's have some drinks and eat something. <laughs>